Hi everybody, in this video we're going to learn about AWS Lambda. This video serves as an introduction to AWS Lambda and we're going to cover some high level topics. So let's get started. We're going to first review event driven architecture and learn how that works. And then we're going to learn the history of AWS with a focus on AWS Lambda. After that, we'll learn what AWS Lambda is, and then we'll learn about some advantages and disadvantages to using Lambda. And I will summarize this all with some quick takeaways that you can put into your pocket. So when you start making decisions towards implementing solutions with Lambda, you will know which problems it works for and which problems it does not. So before we are jumping into learning about AWS Lambda, we should get a high level understanding of what event driven architecture is. An event driven architecture uses events to trigger and communicate between decoupled services. And this is a common architecture in modern applications that are built with microservices. An event is a change in the state or update. Like when you go into your account profile on a website and update your information, that would trigger an event. Events can carry either a state, like the updated profile you have, which would hold like your name and your address, or events can be identifiers. For instance, on YouTube, you can receive a notification that a new video was uploaded on my channel. Event-driven architecture has three key components, event producers, event routers, and event consumers. A producer publishes an event to the event router, which then filters and pushes those events to the event consumers. Producer services and consumer services are decoupled, which allow them to be scaled, updated, and deployed independently. So now that we understand event-driven architecture, let's begin talking about AWS Lambda. But before we just learn about AWS Lambda and how it relates to event-driven architecture, let's understand the history. So to understand AWS a little bit, you have to go back in time a little bit, back to the early 2000s where there was no cloud. Basically, you had to buy hardware from manufacturers and you ended up waiting for it to ship. Did you have to get that hardware, potentially build the server, install software on it, then make it available for software applications so that they could run APIs. And then all that needed to be done, which is called on-prem. Some companies still work today on-prem. But when something is done on-prem, this means that the company owns the hardware and the company has to maintain that hardware. They have to handle all the security aspects to it. And they had to worry about things like general maintenance, worry about hardware fails and failures or any of that sort. And Honestly speaking, this was a pretty big pain in the neck, especially for a newer company that needed to come along and they didn't have this. There was a lot to invest in upfront, but this was a really common mode that a lot of companies relied on because that's all they had. Then around 2006, cloud infrastructure became available and Amazon in 2006 launched the EC2 service. This was an answer to basically what those early companies needed that were getting up in. They couldn't invest in the buying of all those servers and hardware because instead of having to maintain all that hardware and the software and the security aspects to it, Amazon offered a way through a managed service to order compute capacity or a virtual machine. And on top of it, it didn't need to be at a local data center. It was Amazon's data center. And this was amazing. The game had started to change and it was looking great. And it got even better because in 2014, AWS Lambda was launched and Lambda is different than EC2. Lambda is still a compute service that offers your availability to run and execute code. But the key difference between EC2 and Lambda is that Lambda, we pay per the execution. So this means that if you have low traffic, like you're initially starting off your website and you're not going to get a lot of traffic, you're going to pay less. And when it starts ramping up 
and you start having more high traffic, you are just being billed per invocation. And this is far more beneficial than a cost perspective. And also on top of that, you get the benefits of load balancing and the ability to scale along with monitoring that you would get with EC2. So we're starting to talk about how Lambda is different than EC2. Let's then just break this down and find out what is AWS Lambda. So AWS Lambda integrates with other AWS services to invoke functions based on events you specify our events from that event driven architecture. And as we learned in the history of Lambda, it's still a compute service that lets you run your code, which is a function only when needed and it scales automatically. So when you use AWS Lambda, you only pay for the compute time that you use. You don't need to pay for just running this server the whole time because you're only using the server during that moment it is invoked. So for example, you can use Lambda to build data processing triggers for other AWS services or use AWS Lambda to create your own backend microservice that operates at the AWS scale and performance and security. So there's a lot of advantages to using AWS Lambda. It is low cost, okay? You're only paying for the compute time that you use. And if you have low traffic, you're not going to really pay that much if it's not being hit a lot. If you have higher traffic, you pay more, but you're paying for what is being used. You're not paying for it just sitting when there's idle time. So let's say that you're, you get your most traffic at 10 a.m. to 12 p.m., then you pay for that time. And then the rest of the time when it's low traffic, you're not paying for anything. It also improves scalability. During that high traffic time, AWS Lambda will scale automatically. Lambda precisely manages scaling for your functions by running event triggered code in parallel and it processes each event individually. Also, AWS Lambda is highly available. It has a commitment of 99.95% uptime and there is service credit percentages if they do not have that uptime. Now there are some advantages that I didn't list here because the exact same advantages that you get with an EC2 instance, you also get with AWS Lambda. You don't have to manage servers. So Lambda will never fail with running proper code because if the code is working and is deployed, it's not going to fail. Now, you will have to upgrade versions over time because Amazon is handling this maintenance. So eventually you could be using a version of Python that no longer becomes supported. So you still have to maintain your code, but you do not need to maintain your server. Also, AWS Lambda supports multiple languages such as C Sharp, Java, Python, like I mentioned, and Node. But no technology is 100%. No technology solves all the world problems. And that's what I want to highlight here. We've talked about a lot of the advantages and they're great, but there are disadvantages of using AWS Lambda. So the first disadvantage is that with AWS Lambda, there is no local dev. You can manually invoke your function on demand, but you can't call your app like you would if you wanted to do a RESTful API on a local host. So this may not be a problem for everybody, but it is challenging. And if you're used to developing locally and testing locally, this is a very, this is something that you have to change your perspective on. AWS does provide the serverless application model, SAM, which allows you to run one function at a time using a terminal command. And also you can use something like serverless framework, which allows you to use serverless invoke local. There's also tools like local stack that's an emulator. So it's not identical to the real AWS and it's actually kind of expensive. And you could also use AVM, but all these options either mean more money or more problems. And sometimes it's both. 
Now, the pain of having no local development can be offset by the addition of proper debugging tools. But unfortunately with Lambda executions on AWS, there's no way to run that traditional debugger where you can step through your code and set breakpoints. Cloud logs are pretty much your only option for debugging, and this is a big contrast to that traditional local dev, where you can simply look at your terminal and see what's going on. Another disadvantage is your framework and code may need to change. You may find a, a great solution for your problem with a reusable library that's already exists out there, but it might not be compatible or it will struggle to run on Lambda. So for instance, if you wanted to do something like Next.js as a framework, if you wanted to bring that over to a serverless model with AWS Lambda, it's actually very challenging because Next.js uses Vercel. So that's another disadvantage that you have to keep in mind. Another disadvantage of AWS Lambda is that the automatic scaling can actually lead to a denial of service attack against yourself because Lambda's, Lambda's can scale automatically. And then if you have a downstream service that gets triggered by these Lambda events, like a database connection pool, you have to be prepared because you could actually end up overwhelming the database connection pool. Now, as I uh, talked about before, as an advantage of Lambda, with not having to maintain your services, that also becomes a disadvantage because upgrades can actually be challenging when you're using Lambda because programming language updates are mandated and enforced. So Lambda must be maintained regularly and upgraded due to Lambda runtime deprecation policies. But this can also be a pain point because if you try to be proactive and upgrade, you'll find that Lambda actually has a slow adoption of the latest programming languages release. So even if you went ahead, even if you wanted to get out ahead of the deprecation policy and move to the latest LTS, you might find out that they're not supporting that LTS version. So for example, the latest runtime support currently is October 2022 in this video for Node is version 16. But Node version 18 will become LTS this, by the end of October. So if you want it to move up to Node 18 right now, you would not be able to with Lambda. Now, in truth, no application is truly finished and you always need to be periodically upgrading your code uh, to get the latest patches and security fixes. But this is something that you may want to control over being dictated by Amazon. Now, another disadvantage of Lambda is the fact that you are locked in to using AWS. If you make a design solely based around AWS Lambdas, then you will not be able to take that code and immediately bring it over to Azure versus something like a container-based service where you can pick it up and move it to whatever vendor you want to do. So choosing to go with AWS Lambda implementations will lock you into using AWS Lambda without significant code changes in order to migrate to another system. And finally, the last disadvantage of Lambda is that Lambda has quotas and there's limitations that developers need to take into account. So you have to spend time either tuning properly or you need to work with AWS to expand them as they do offer a way for you to expand the quotas if it's necessary for you. So an example of some quotas would be if you have your Lambda handle API calls, then both the request and the response cannot exceed six megabytes. You might also want to run your AWS Lambda as a batch job, but if you do that, it cannot exceed 15 minutes. And each AWS account only al allows a total of 75 gigabytes of Lambda storage in each region. That may sound like a lot for you, but if you're working in a team environment at a larger company, uh, you need to make sure that you're cleaning up previous versions regularly because you can hit that quota and then it prevents others in the business from deploying their code. 
The advantages of the AWS Lambda are great, but you need to keep the mindset that there are disadvantages. It is not a general purpose solution. So you need to truly understand the problem you are trying to solve and what your team's knowledge is and the limitations that they have. You don't want to force a bunch of C++ developers to use Lambda tomorrow. And you also need to just be aware of where your company is at overall. If you go with a certain solution and uh, then you're going to be stuck with a vendor lock-in or you're stuck at certain runtime versions or you have to deal with other disadvantages like not having local dev and maybe the developers aren't ready for that. So given all those advantages and disadvantages, let's understand what Lambda is a bad fit for. Lambda is a bad fit for high availability services due to its cold start times. That cold start time can make it bad for services like authentication, and you could use the provision con concurrency, but then it's no longer serverless, which kind of defeats the purpose of all those advantages for Lambda. AWS Lambda is not appropriate for UI apps that are purely static content, like a single page uh, application. You should use a different infrastructure like uh, an S3 bucket. It's also not a good fit for a WebSocket app because clients can outlive the 15 minute time limit. It also will probably be a bad fit for big data applications where there's heavy data processing jobs. You would probably want to use EMR or Glue. Along with that, it's a bad fit for heavy mathematical computations that do number crunching because that might not be a good idea because of the CPU, memory, and time limits that exist. And finally, it's a bad fit for systems that need to be always on and stateful because lambdas are stateless and short-lived under 15 minutes. Now, don't take this video as the fact of don't use AWS Lambda. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is to understand your problem and understand the makeup of your team overall before you start jumping in and saying AWS Lambda is the solution to this problem. It is not always the solution. Think about AWS Lambda as a good solution for event-based architecture. Changing a microservice to be event-based and acting off of events, and if the task or functions that are being called are short-lived, that is a great solution for AWS Lambda. What it's not a solution for is what I described here. Hopefully now you understand a little bit more about AWS Lambda and you're ready to start developing AWS functions. So if you like what you saw, please subscribe to my channel so you can get notified about other AWS videos that I make and also videos that I make generally around computer science and software engineering topics. Until then, happy learning.